on to our third video on the breast cancer review. As you can see, today we'll discuss the BIRATS 5 and we'll also review some other concepts. So let's get started. For breast cancer risk models, we know that we have different models. And the main thing to know is that we have models like the Gale model, which are older but very validated. We also have other models based on genetics and we have comprehensive models that try to include different factors when assessing a, a risk for breast cancer in, in patients. And moving on to, to our technique, so we, when we do mammography, we really focus a lot on technique. And we should be aware of different types of artifacts and what's desired when we do our traditional CC or craniocaudal or MLO when we're talking about medial lateral oblique views. So in essence, we want to ma uh, maximize the resolution and we want to minimize the motion or the uh, blur artifact. So a big thing for this is going to be compression. And compression has a lot of benefits from the physics standpoint in that it will decrease dose, it will in in improve our, our resolution, and really the, the main uh, problem with compression is obviously patient discomfort. But if we can manage that patient discomfort, the benefits of or compression are, are really great. So I think that we'll leave it there for, for technique, uh, just so you're aware. We also want to make sure that um, we cover enough of the, of the breast tissue. And we have this thing called the posterior nipple line. And it's kind of an imaginary line drawn from the MLO. Uh, from the nipple to the chest wall and you want to make sure that it, it touches the, uh, the chest wall in order to be adequate. Jumping into the BIRATS category, let's start by reviewing what all the BIRATS terminology means. So um, first of all, we're dealing with BIRATS uh, 5, but it's really BIRATS 5th edition, right? Because we don't want to confuse it with the actual BIRATS 5 category for breast cancer. When we do screening mammograms, we expect to identify about three to eight cancers per every 1,000 mammograms. And this is really something that's regulated, regulated at a federal level in the United States. And we'll have some numbers that we'll discuss later on based on, on these regulations. So starting with BIRATS1, BIRATS1 is the uh, most benign uh, category, and it means we have a, no we have a totally normal mammogram. Then we move to BIRATS2, and this means that we do have some findings, but those findings are benign findings. And they can be um, findings such as oil cysts, lipomas, um, hamartomas, or things that we see on the mammogram, but we know they're benign. For BIRATS3, I think a, a key point is also now we need to start talking about the, the percentage or the chance of cancer. So BIRATS3, by definition, means that we have less than 2% chance of what we're seeing being cancer. So usually BIRATS3 requires a two-year follow-up, and we have six-month intervals in which we do this, this follow-up. After BIRATS3, we move to BIRATS4, which in essence will pretty much require a biopsy. And a BIRATS4 is defined as having a risk for cancer from 2 to 95%. And, and that's a, the risk for malignancy. Some people uh, further subdivide this in BIRATS 4A, BIRATS 4B, and BIRATS 4C. The BIRATS 4A will range from 2% to 10%, and it's considered low suspicion for malignancy. BIRATS 4B, it's moderate suspicion for malignancy, and it ranges from 10 to 50%. The BIRATS 4C, as you can imagine, is high suspicion for malignancy, and it ranges from 50% to 95%. So BIRATS 4 is perhaps the most important category when we're talking about something we're suspicious and that might require a biopsy. So there's a very wide range here. And in essence, if you're gonna classify a bit between 4A, 4B, and 4C, you have the, the biggest percentage range in this area. When we move to BIRATS 5, 
this is really defined by more than 95% chance of malignancy. So you're pretty much saying that you're suspicious or really suspicious about this lesion and after you do biopsy you're expecting to find something that is concordant with your impression. So that's really important because after you do a biopsy it is your responsibility to review that pathology to make sure that not only you were in the right place but that the pathology report actually fits what you saw based on imaging and that's a concept that will improve patient care in order for you to make sure you're getting the right diagnosis based on your level of suspicion. Finally, we have the two special cases which are BIRAT0 and BIRAT6. BIRAT6 is really pathologically proven cancer and that's the, the number we use once we have that biopsy proven um, malignancy. For BIRAT0, it is usually used for screeners when we have an incomplete workup. So for example, I have a patient that comes for a screening mammogram and there's some calcifications, but I can't really describe the calcifications based on the screening mammogram. So I'll probably recommend Spot Max. And for, for me to do that, I'll place the patient in a BIRAT zero category and bring the patient back for the additional views. Also, for a patient that you think might have a mass, you can use BIRAT zero and then move to ultrasound to further assess that lesion. So it is important to know that BIRAT0 and BIRAT2 are probably going to be the most common BIRAT category used when doing diagnostic mammograms. So after that brief introduction, let's move on to the actual BIRATS lexicon and what it means to use the BIRATS uh, category or the BIRATS descriptors for everything. So starting with mammography, we know that we want to describe the four main breast compositions, whether they're predominantly fatty, whether they have fibroglandular density, whether they're a little bit heterogeneous, or whether they're extremely dense. So all those four categories, we must place our patient in one of those. If we see a mass, we want to describe a mass based on shape, margin, and density. When we talk about shape, we only have three keywords that we want to use. So it's either oval, round, or irregular. When we talk about margin, we have circumscribed, obscured, microlobulated, indistinct, or speculated. For density, it is either high density, equal density, or isodense, or we have low density, or hypodense, and fat containing. Calcifications can be a little bit tricky. And for typically benign calcifications, we have a lot of patterns that we can see. We can have dermal calcifications, we can have vascular calcification, we can have popcorn-like calcifications that are traditionally associated with fibroadenomas, we can have large rod-like rod -like calcification, we have rounded calcification, rim, dystrophic, milk of calcium, and suture related. For the suspicious morphology, we'll have amorphous, coarse, heterogeneous, fine pleomorphic, which is pretty suspicious, and fine linear or fine linear branching, which is also suspicious. Distribution goes from diffuse, regional, grouped, linear, or segmental. And in this case, I want to emphasize that linear or segmental are probably the most suspicious of all the distributions. And the reason for that is that most cancers start in the duct. And um, when they start in this single duct, they will acquire this linear or segmental distribution that will be the most concerning one. Also, when we talk about mammograms, we wanna talk about architectural distortion. We wanna talk about asymmetry and asymmetries are involved in four different categories or four different descriptors. In asymmetry, you can have a global asymmetry, a focal asymmetry, and a developing asymmetry. For lymph nodes, intramammary lymph nodes are usually located in the outer quadrants. 
So you'll see we have some danger zones that while we might have a lymph node, we really need to investigate further just to confirm. While we have a lymph node in the outer quadrant, uh, we know that's fairly common. However, we also know that that's a site for cancer, so we have to be careful when assessing lymph nodes in general. And you'll see here we have associated features and location of lesions that are also additional components of the BIRATS category. Moving on to ultrasound, we have that uh, some other keywords that will be similar, but all others will be different. So we do tissue composition between homogeneous background, uh, consistent with fat, homogeneous background architecture, but more fibroglandular. We have heterogeneous background architecture. And then if we have a mass, we also describe it based on shape. In this case, orientation, whether parallel or not parallel, will be important. Um, that's why it used to be described as uh, taller than wide. We also describe the margin, and you'll notice that we really care about whether it's circumscribed or not circumscribed. If it's not circumscribed, then you have four different types that you can uh, select to describe this, whether it's distinct, angular, microlobulated, or speculated. Echo pattern, although not necessarily that helpful, is also described as part of the BIRATS. The posterior features, what it means is the ultrasound physics, depending on what type of tissue you have in front of it, after the ultrasound signal, you either have posterior acoustic enhancement or posterior acoustic shadowing. And that's another component of our description of a mass when seen on ultrasound. When we see calcification, which we can, although it's not optimal on ultrasound, we also describe them using the BIRATS lexicon. Finally, we have associated features that we might include in an ultrasound report, and we have special cases in which common ones are cluster microcysts, or when we're talking about lymph nodes, in which we see a hypoechoic cortex and a hyperechoic uh, hilum. Also, we like to see some vascularity within the hilum of this lymph node when we're talking about ultrasound. So I think this video summarizes a lot of concepts and gives you a good introduction to what BIRATS 5 is and or BIRATS 5th edition is and why we want to use it in order to be consistent.